This is a really good Bible question that's come up a few times around my channel in the past couple weeks about what's the oldest stuff in the Bible, either the oldest text or the oldest complete book. Several people have been asking me, especially after I made that video, talking about how the book of Job, which many people think is the oldest book in the Bible, is actually one of the younger books in the Bible, a product of the 6th century BC, probably at the earliest, uh, maybe even later, 5th or 4th century BCE. Um, but it is an interesting question. I mean, when we just casually encounter the Bible and we're reading it sort of from left to right, um, we're reading from Genesis and onward. And that sort of makes it seem as though Genesis is the oldest text. After all, it is the first text that most people encounter. Uh, but biblical scholars have known for a long time now, I mean, even going back to the Middle Ages, um, that the order that the texts appear in is not necessarily indicative of the order that the texts are written in. Uh, and that can be kind of a strange experience for people to realign their expectations about these biblical texts. So I wanted to make sort of a longer video and talk about what's old in the Bible, why people think it's old, and then address the specific point that somebody made about uh, the late Michael Heiser saying that some of the stuff in Isaiah chapters 1 through 39 might very well be some of the oldest stuff in the Bible. So first, let me make clear, there, there's a big difference between asking what the oldest stuff in the Bible is and asking what the oldest book in the Bible is. And that's because newer books, relatively newer books, can preserve material, uh, individual chapters and things like that, that are much older than the text that it's eventually been incorporated into. Whereas the you know, oldest book in the Bible, we're talking about like the oldest complete text or something that va at least vaguely approximates the final form of the text that we have today. So those are two very different questions. The question of the oldest stuff in the Bible is, I, I mean, I, I've never seen significant debate about this amongst like the top options that biblical scholars hold up. Um, the top candidates for oldest stuff in the Bible is always Exodus 15, the Song of the Sea, um, and Judges chapter 5, the Song of Deborah. These are very old texts. They have old archaic language. They have old theology, old conceptions of God. They relate old traditions um, about the founding of Israel, about who the people of Israel are, about the ethnic relations amongst people in Israel, about the way that Israel is governed and organized, about the way that ancient Israel functions in military contexts, uh, old mythic language from other parts of ancient Southwest Asia. Um, so it's just both these texts are very, very old. They have a legitimate chance of being some of the oldest stuff in the Bible. They have a legitimate chance of being uh, from the 11th century BCE or older, um, whereas 99% of the rest of the stuff that we find in the Hebrew Bible is uh, within the first millennium BC from the 10th century BCE and on. There aren't very many texts that have a, a, a even a shot at being older than that, but these two poems do. After those two poems, like the next things that get brought up in conversations about all this stuff in the Bible would probably be something like the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, at least parts of the Song of Moses, uh, and then potentially Genesis 49, Jacob's blessing of his sons. Now, those might be very old texts as well. After that, we'd probably be talking about things like some of the royal psalms. If you want a list of royal psalms, you can like Google royal psalms. And uh, this goes back to some work uh, of some German scholars uh, from the early parts of the 20th century, identifying these mini genres within the psalms. The royal psalms, which are about God's relationship to a king that's recently been installed on the throne. Uh, these are probably very old as well. So that's the oldest stuff in the Bible, like individual chapters, individual pieces of poetry that's old. If we then move on to what's the oldest book in the Bible, uh, things become a bit more difficult to pin down, in, in large part because virtually every text in the Hebrew Bible has a substantial editorial and like traditioning process after that, where there's an initial period of composition, and then people go back later and then they uh, supplement some of these earlier versions of a story with new material. Um, so that's not an uncommon thing to have happen. And we're also very unclear about exactly what the process of composing many of these texts is like. Uh, do individuals write them? Uh, do they have, do individuals with like a school of disciples gathered around them take down, you know, what somebody is saying and then record that and then that gets stored somewhere or worked on somewhere? How does it get copied? What is that copying process like? There's a lot of very difficult to answer questions here that make it hard to like firmly pin down uh, what an earliest book in the Bible might be. Having said that, the texts that I've seen come up most often about uh, among mainline biblical scholars about what the earliest book in the Bible might be is usually Amos or Hosea. Um, but sections of Isaiah, like in Isaiah chapters 1 through 39, as this comment points out, or parts of Micah also are part of that conversation. That's because, broadly speaking, these are all 
uh, being composed and responding to historical circumstances in the mid 8th century BCE. So they are roughly um, being composed at around the same time. They're roughly contemporaneous figures responding to basically the same historical situation. In the middle of the 8th century BCE, the Neo-Assyrian Empire, which had been dormant both sort of economically and militarily for several generations, suddenly goes on the warpath. A new king um, rises to power, Tiglath Pileser III. He's the one that actually sort of creates and adopts the policy of um, resettlement of conquered peoples. And that's and this is a policy that eventually the Babylonian Empire is going to adopt after the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And that's why uh, people in Israel end up in captivity or in exile in Babylon. That's that's a holdover from the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And it's one of Tiglath Pileser's sort of new policies. But um, he has a, um, a dramatic period of conquest and of the subjugation of foreign peoples. And it's really in response to that military and political pressure that occasions the composition of Amos, Hosea, some parts of Isaiah, and, and the book of Micah as well. Just looking at the texts themselves, Amos seems to be the earliest among these because he's prophesying during the reign of a king of Judah named Uzziah, uh, whereas these other figures are prophesying perhaps at the very end of Uzziah's reign and then later, uh, so that the text seems to position itself as the earliest among these. Uh, and Amos itself doesn't make as many reference to specific events that are happening during this time period. And if it were composed later, uh, for example, Amos seems to prophesy the destruction of northern Samaria. If it were com composed after or within the window of the actual destruction of the northern kingdom uh, and the capital of Samaria, it seems like somebody would have gone back and been like, hey, turns out Amos was actually right about this. Uh, so that seems to position Amos as the earliest of these figures. Having said that, there are for sure parts of Isaiah chapters 1 through 39 that are quite old, nearly as old as that. And so it is not like a ridiculous thing for somebody to say that that might be some of the earliest stuff in the Hebrew Bible. But it really is only parts of Isaiah 1 through 39. And you might be thinking, why Isaiah 1 through 39 and not the rest of it? There is, after all, like 27 chapters more to the text than that. So why just Isaiah 1 through 39 and why just parts of Isaiah 1 through 39? In order to answer that question, we have to take a, a quick look at the structure of the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is the most editorially complex book in the entire Hebrew Bible, according to John Collins. And even a casual read of the text might alert you to this fact because it has a dazzling array of imagery and of genres, some of which are sort of sandwiched together back to back in ways that don't necessarily make sense. There's a lot of shifting in topic, shifting of person, shifting in the kind of material that we're reading as though it's been heavily edited at some point. And biblical scholars who investigated this question in more depth um, have divided up the book of Isaiah in a lot of different ways. It's possible that some of the material that's original to Isaiah that might be reasonably traced to a prophetic figure at the end of the 8th century BCE might be some of the oldest stuff in the Bible. But then there's also a lot of other stuff in the book of Isaiah that can't really be traced back to this original figure. Um, and so it might be helpful to see a little bit of a breakdown of that stuff that might likely be original and the rest of the stuff that probably isn't original and then sort of some reasons why biblical scholars might think that. So as far as stuff that might be original, Isaiah 1 through 12 at the beginning of the text, this has the introduction with some introductory oracles. Um, and then we have is, uh, Isaiah's call narrative, which is a very common feature for prophetic figures in Isaiah chapter 6, which takes place in the year that King Uzziah dies. And that sort of also positions it after uh, Amos, for example. And then we have some um, narrative material that deals with Isaiah's interaction uh, with some kings during the Syro-Ephraimite War which is uh, essentially a war occasioned by political pressures exerted by the Neo-Assyrian Empire on Aram, Damascus, and northern Israel. You can look up Syro-Ephraimite War if you want more information about that. Um, but it's, it's very specific. It's sort of a, a vertical slice of time dealing with a very specific historical issue. Uh, and many of these chapters are commonly attributed to this original figure of Isaiah. Then we have chapters 17 through 23, which are about half of the oracles against the nations. Oracles against the nation is a very common sort of mini genre within prophetic literature. Amos has some of these, Micah has some of these, Jeremiah and Ezekiel have a bunch of oracles against the nation. A very common feature of prophetic literature. Um, about half of these uh, might be attributed, uh, the ones that sort of make most sense in an 8th century context might be attributed to an original uh, Isaiah. And then we have Isaiah's chapters 28 through 33, which is a collection of largely miscellaneous oracles, but, but nevertheless oracles that seem um, to have a very consistent theology uh, of uh, the inviability of Zion. That is the idea that God 
um, will defend Jerusalem and the temple, even against foreign threats. God, God's self will actually do it and come down from heaven and fight those battles if necessary. There's absolutely no way that God is going to allow Jerusalem and the temple to be destroyed, which proves true in sort of the short term, but not necessarily uh, in the long term. Um, so those also seem very situated in the original 8th century context. But then, almost everything else in the book of Isaiah seems not to be original or not reasonably part of an original composition that we can attribute to a figure named Isaiah, and therefore probably not some of the oldest stuff in the Bible. Some of this is the result of copying. For example, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4 copies from Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, word for word. Um, we know that it's Isaiah copying from Micah rather than Micah copying from Isaiah because Isaiah takes it out of context and removes one of the verse. The actual oracle in Micah goes through verse 5. Uh, Isaiah seems to remove the bit uh, that relates to, that has this very pluralistic uh, kind of dimension to it because Isaiah has no desire to be pluralistic. Isaiah is a very ethnocentric text, whereas Micah, partially because of Micah's uh, lack of belief in uh, the inviability of Zion. Micah is convinced that Jerusalem is destroyed. He sort of has a broader perspective on God's interaction with the world. Isaiah is very focused on the nation of Judah uh, and how it's going to survive and how God loves Judah so much and all this kind of stuff. Um, so it's Isaiah who seems to be taking Micah out of context. Uh, Isaiah copies from Micah. Micah is a later text, so that's probably not original to Isaiah. Um, Isaiah is chapter 15 through 16, that third line there, also copies from Jeremiah 48. Jeremiah is a much later text, 100 years later or more. Um, and so that's uh, not going to be original to a figure in the 8th century BC either. Isaiah chapter 13 through 14, that second line right there, um, is part of the oracles against the nations um, that we saw above, but uh, is, is oracles against Babylon, which would not be on anybody's mind in the 8th century BC. Prophesying against ba Babylon is, is at this point sort of a loosely affiliated collection uh, of, of powers that are subjugated to the Neo-Assyrian Empire. So identifying them as a, as a particular people group who's threatening to Judah is kind of nonsensical. It makes much more sense later once Babylon overtakes the Neo-Assyrian Empire and, and sort of takes charge of the region, then it makes a lot more sense and lines up with other things that we find in some of the later prophets in the Bible as well. Isaiah 24 through 27 is sometimes referred to as the little apocalypse of Isaiah. This is much later material, probably some of the latest stuff in the book of Isaiah, even though it, it doesn't seem that way, being chapters 24 through 27. Apoc apocalyptic literature in general is very, very late in the Hebrew Bible. All our clear examples of apocalyptic literature are late, late. You get some of this in Zechariah, that's post-exilic, and you get some of this in Daniel, uh, which is very late. I mean, the old, the the latest parts of Daniel are in the second century BCE, so like literally the latest stuff composed in the Hebrew Bible. Apocalypse as a genre is late, so its appearance here in chapters 24 through 27 is kind of strange. Most scholars date that much later, likely not original to an Isaiah of Jerusalem in the 8th century BCE. Chapters 34 uh, through 35 uh, of Isaiah are very similar to what we find in Isaiah's chapter 40 through 55, which I'll comment on in just a second and are, and are written later. Uh, chapters 40 through 55 is often referred to as Second Isaiah. Uh, it's written at the end of the 6th century BCE, encouraging the people of Israel to return home from captivity in Babylon. It's dealing with an entirely different historical situation. One of the favored m metaphors in Second Isaiah is the idea of the personification of the wilderness land and a, and a, and a the sort of almost a conjuring of a highway that's going to facilitate the people moving back from Babylon to Jerusalem. Uh, and that's very similar. That's That language is iconic for 2nd Isaiah, and we find it also here in these chapters, chapters 34 and 35. Uh, so it seems, it seems to have much more in common with this later text than it does uh, with the parts that we see in 1st Isaiah chapters 1 through 39. Chapters 36 through 39 in Isaiah copies 2nd Kings chapters 18 through 20 in many places word for word. Um, Second Kings, the, the entirety of Second Kings is an exilic composition around 550 BCE, so 150 plus some years after Isaiah, likely not original to the text. And then we have Second and Third Isaiah in chapters 40 through 55, and then 56 through 66 as well. Second Isaiah, again, is a uh, text composed at the very end of the exilic period, 539, 538 BC, encouraging the people of Israel to return home. 
um, from captivity in Babylon. This is a text that speaks about uh, King Cyrus of Persia, who frees sort of the people of Israel from captivity in Babylon in effectively past tense that it, with a perfect aspect as though this has already happened. So this text is, is historically positioning itself much later than what's happening at the end of the 8th century BCE. And then third Isaiah, beginning in chapters 56 through 66, also positions itself different historically by having conversa renewed conversations about how temple practice should be undertaken. So it makes most sense in a context where the temple has been rebuilt, which isn't until almost 20 years after the people uh, actually get to return from Babylon. So that's an entire generation later after the material that we're seeing in second Isaiah. All that to say, it's entirely possible that some of the stuff in Isaiah chapter 1 through 39 is some of the oldest stuff in the Bible, as, as the Heiser comment pointed out, but not all of it. And, and hopefully now you have a, a, a bit more appreciation for why it might only be some of it and, and some more ways to think about some of the oldest stuff in the Hebrew Bible.